All right, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's Board of Ed meeting. The date is Tuesday, October 8th, 2019. And I really would appreciate if you turn off your cell phones as this meeting is being recorded. Um, Ellen, can you please do our roll call? Thank you, Chairperson Granado. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Fitzpatrick? Here. Mr. Healy? Ms. McCurdy? Here. Mr. Morris? Mrs. Paradise? Present. Vice Chairperson Mr. Hill? Here. Chairperson Mrs. Granado? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative Mr. Isaac Santos? Here. All present. Okay, thank you. And we have some guest staff and students, and they're going to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and they're from Emerson Williams School. Come on up. Thank you, you were excellent at that. And um, Mr. Emmett, we then have Emerson Williams giving a presentation. This we evening. certainly do. We have a uh, special group of people here this evening, some phonics scientists uh, that are going to be talking with you about phonics instruction. Yes, you know who you are. So <laughs> come on up, folks. Good evening. I'm Brendan McLaughlin. I serve as a reading and language arts consultant at Emerson Williams School, and I'm here with my colleagues. Um, Pam Jones is a first grade teacher at Emerson. Um, Ms. Jen, Ms. Jen Hammer serves as a curriculum specialist in the area of literacy, both for our school and for Webb School. And Nicole Yatrusis, who's a kindergarten teacher at our school. And we wanted to um, share with you, since our district's adoption of the Columbia uh, units of study in um, phonics, since the adoption of that program in kindergarten in grade one last year, and now implementation of it in grade two as well, we wanted to share with you some of the joys of teaching and learning in this program. But to begin, We thought we would speak to the question of what is phonics. So the best, um, the, the clearest definition that I have is, is um, this. Phonics is the relationship between the letters of written language and the sound of spoken language. So that it follows then that children's reading and their writing development is dependent on their understanding of the alphabetic principle so that idea that letters and letter patterns represent the sound of spoken language. So you can see on the screen, um, here's an example. And this is a typical kindergartner. You can see on the left side, at the very beginning of kindergarten this year. And then just four weeks later. And that transformation from simply drawing pictures to using letters, but not just letters, but uh, we've got beginning and ending consonants. We've even got some vowels in there. That transformation is not accidental. That, that change in, um, in writing ability is illustrative of, um, of an excellent program and high quality instruction. So it's a very powerful culmination. So one of the things that we think is really important are the principles that are foundational to this um, curriculum. And the first one is that this curriculum is, 
based on a variety of research. Because, because it comes out of Columbia and the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project, they are a tremendous think tank. They essentially synthesize the research that other people have done and they've taken the best parts of other phonics programs and essentially created their own. Um, the other hallmark of the program is that it is strategy based. So rather than kids memorizing rules, they're really learning how to study words and patterns. So essentially, in, instead of just being knowledgeable about how one word works, they learn how to become knowledgeable at how, about how many words work. Um, it's extremely efficient. Our phonics workshops in our K2 classrooms are meant to be um, done in 20 minutes. And that's not to say that the instruction is happening quickly and not well. It's meant to say that they recognize that all of the other components of balanced literacy, reader's workshop, writer's workshop, shared writing, shared reading, are all tremendously important and they value that it, they want to ensure that a teacher has time for all of those other things. The biggest part is that we need to ensure that it's transferable. If students are not applying what they're learning in phonics to their reading and writing, then it's all for naught. So Teachers College ensures that there are opportunities both embedded in the reader's workshop and the writer's workshop to apply everything that they're learning in phonics. And most importantly for our kids, it's extremely engaging. Every unit has a storyline. They're becoming superheroes. They're becoming word scientists. They're becoming word detectives. Um, every lesson, almost every day, has some type of game or chant or song. And I think the most engaging part is that each um, grade level has a stuffed animal mascot that serves as kind of a co-teacher <laughs> alongside the classroom teacher. And in kindergarten, we have Mabel, the elephant. And in grade one, we have well, Rashid. 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 Yes. And in grade two, it's a dragon named Gus. And just adding on to that, I use Mabel in my kindergarten classroom, and my students love her so much that last year she actually got a birthday crown for her birthday. We don't know when her birthday is, but she got a birthday crown, so she is very loved, and it's such a big part of our curriculum, and they really do enjoy doing phonics. Um, and so for how does the phonics workshop go, it's very similar to how the reader's workshop and writer's workshop units are. There's a mini lesson that's about six to eight minutes, there's a connection to really get the students engaged in what the lesson is and activate their prior knowledge. There is a teach which is very explicit so the student knows what they are learning. There is then an active engagement which is when the students get support in what they're learning a new skill. And then there's a link which helps the student think about the transference and how it applies to readers and writers workshop. And probably the most important part of that is the rug time. Um, students can be with partners or with rug clubs which is about five or six students and they're practicing what they are learning and it's extremely hands-on. They're either sorting pictures, they're writing on whiteboards, they're talking with each other and interacting which is great and the whole time the teacher is coaching the student and also formally, formatively assessing the student as well. And at the end of the lesson there's a whole group debrief on the work and a reminder of the skills and strategies and there's some really great um, anchor charts that the students can always refer to during other parts of the day. Um, and there's a lot of really playful activities that also end the lesson called extensions, which don't have to be done right with the phonics workshop, but before we're going to recess or we're going to lunch or the end of the day, those can also be done and they're very engaging and just get the students remembering the skills that they've learned. And we have Pam Jones going to talk about the video that she made with her class. So our first grade unit begins with a review of the kindergarten skills. So the kids really are just reviewing the, the consonants, including the hard and soft C and G. Like a hard C would be like the beginning of the word cat. A soft G would be like the beginning of the word city. They're reviewing the vowels, the long and short vowels. They're reviewing blends and digraphs. And the way they do it is really cool. They do a fun little name study. And so I have this video. We decided to invite in a special guest who came into our classroom and we studied his name. You can probably see who the guest is, but you'll see him shortly when we start the video. And uh, so this is just a quick little snippet of what phonics would kind of look like. 
but this was the end of our name review study, so I hope you enjoy and learn a little bit about phonics. been learning how to look at names and really study them. We, we know that um, we don't just look at the name and read it. We need to look at the name and really look at the letters in the name using everything that we've learned from kindergarten yeah. and even stuff that we've learned so far in first grade to really study a name. And it's going to help us in the long run to be able to study words and learn how to spell, be better spellers. Right, phonics professors? Yeah! Okay, so what we want to do right now is we would like to study your name, and then we would like to add your name to our wall of name fame. Are you ready, phonics professors? Yeah! yeah! Thank you, Professor Leaders. Have a seat. And now we want to just really study this word. Let's look at it carefully. What do you notice, Hunter? Um, it has double letters and M. Ooh, what, double, what letters are double and M it? E, M, and E. Wow. What do you notice, Ava? Um, two and what do you notice, Margaret? His name is from a movie. What do you notice, Charlotte? There is a word, me. Ooh. What do you notice, Adna? And can we think about the names on our on our word yes. wall? And can you tell me how how a name on a word wall is similar to Mr. Emmett's name? Ooh. I like oh, that yeah, name. What do you notice, Medina? Like in my name, he has at the beginning an M, and I have a beginning at the end. And what kind of an M is that? Opposite. Oh, what do you notice, Sophia? Um, I don't have a T in my name. And, and Mr. Emmett does. What do you notice, Charlotte? Um, if you just switch the E at the end, and then I have two E, two T's, and I have an E at in the end of my name. My name, too. Wow, you all are really studying this name very well. What do you, does anyone see anything that's different in Mr. Emmett's name um, compared to the names on our word wall? Ooh, what do you see, Grace? Um, <coughs> my name starts with a G and his starts with an E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, and I see that, too. What do you see, Charlotte? Um, the, um, he has an M and I do not have an M. Mm -hmm. And his name is Charlotte. What do you see, Hunter? He has a vowel, I mean a <coughs> consonant at the end of his name, and Charlotte doesn't. And Charlotte doesn't. What's at the end of Charlotte? Mm. Now let's take our blends and digraphs, and let's see if we can make our name a little silly. Let's try FL. You ready? Felista Flemeth. Oh, my heart. That's one you'd like to try. Oh, let's listen to Margaret. What do you have? GL. Huh? GL. You ready for GL? What would it be, boys and girls? Glista Glemeth. Oh. Let's try one with Sophia. What do you have? WH. WH. Are you ready? What would it be? Whisker Lemon. <laughs> I like that. I love the name. Let's try. Oh, what do you have? S W. S W. Oh, here we go, boys and girls. Whisker 
Anyone have a question? I have one question I'd like to ask. Um, we had kindergarten up there, the first day of school, I think it was then four weeks later. What are the expectations as they come into kindergarten? Should they be known, unless I sound like a parent, a grandparent, should they know their sounds, their letters and their sounds? Is that what we're expecting of them? That's not what we're expecting of them. Um, usually in the beginning of kindergarten, they're just drawing a picture or maybe they're doing like if it's the word me that they're drawing, they could do the M for me. Um, but as the phonics gets a little bit more intensive, they're really able to start hearing all those sounds and putting them into their writing. Um, but at the beginning of kindergarten, there is definitely um, not an expectation for them to know all their letters and sounds. Okay, mm -hmm. great. <coughs> Evan? I just have a question. In, regarding, in regards to phonics beyond kindergarten first second grade is there like a transition almost where they it's not that they obviously they, they build upon what they've learned where kind of spelling becomes more um, important and that kind of thing so it used to be that we thought of the primary or some people it's never been my line of thinking but um, for for some time people would think in terms of the primary grades as being the grades when you learned, and I know your question is about spelling, but um, by way of background, the primary grades as being the time when kids um, are learning to read, and then after that, they're reading to learn. So similarly, with the writing processes, um, it followed a, a similar line of thinking. But with the approach that we're taking now, we're really building in that groundwork so the kids are freer earlier to be able to focus on meaning and not use up all their energy on right. cracking the code, right. either for reading or for writing. So then as they have this really strong foundation, they can do deeper um, word work earlier and be freer for their expression. So once kids um, sit in word study and um, in spelling is our program now for grades three and higher. It was our primary program as well, but the TC Phonics has now replaced that. And so as our kids now in second grade also um, have this groundwork, they're in an even stronger position than they were before. Right. And freer also to delve into deeper vocabulary work. Yeah, and just more obviously more emphasis on comprehension as opposed to worrying about that I got these four words correctly. Exactly. Yeah. So you'll notice um, there's a, there's a lot of <laughs> you'll notice there's a lot of noticing. So rather than getting <coughs> a bunch of rules in kids' bones and then expecting them to apply them, early on we're developing the principle of what do you notice? What else do you notice? Because in the <coughs> English language for all of the rules, there are myriad yeah. exceptions. Right, right. So by just teaching the rules, then we have the problem of, well, when do the exceptions apply and when the, do they not apply? And just holding all of those rules and exceptions becomes a whole study unto itself. So what we really want is for the kids to be flexible and nimble early on about what they're noticing. And <coughs> the, the real groundwork of this is, um, I think any neuroscientist would speak to this, but I believe it was in Patricia Cunningham's work where um, she was quoted um, saying the mind is a natural pattern seeker. So what we're trying to do with the kids reading and writing is to get them to notice what's alike about these words, what's different, 
what applies here in this context. In the earlier we can develop that kind of pattern thinking, we're also at the same time developing kids' ability to think <coughs> critically, not just for those reading writing tasks, but then also more quickly and easily into the depth of what they're reading and writing about. So while we're speaking here specifically about phonics, it winds up opening the pathway for much deeper, much more critical work all across our curriculum. It's funny, and as a, <clears throat> as a parent, you almost see my, my children come home and if they, like, they don't like, they do not care if they misspell a word. They just, you know, I'm immediately, I, that's the first thing I would point to because that's how I was taught and that's how, the way my brain is, is now triggered. They do not think that way at all. They just keep going and then see where the story takes them. Yeah, and, in, and that's part of what we're developing um, early on. So we're not expecting kids that, you know, depending on, on the stage of their development, um, either gotcha. by their grade level or their own personal development, we're expecting them to apply what they've learned. And we're getting better and better and better all the time at holding them to account to what they have learned and then gradually raising the bar and then continuing to hold them account. So there's got to be a period of learning and, and practice and approximation. So when, you're, when your children are really little, for example, and they're just learning to speak, they'll, they'll say mommy or daddy or in the very beginning, it doesn't sound to anybody else like that. But to those who love these beautiful little babies, they're like, oh my gosh, yeah, that was definitely mommy or that was, <laughs> that was definitely dad, you know, whatever it was. And then the child picks up on that and then begins every time thereafter to ever more closely approximate those real words. So that very same principle applies to kids' spelling and writing and all of yeah. their mm -hmm. work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else with a question, John? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. Great presentation. I appreciate that. How long has this particular program been working at Emerson Williams? So we adopted the program across district for kindergarten and first grade last year. Um, they were still in the process of writing the grade two curriculum, so the grade two curriculum came on board this year. So we're kind of in our second year of partial implementation. Next year, K2 across the board. So you've seen some transition with last year's kindergarten to this year's first grade. Yes. Oh, yeah. Pam, do you want to speak to that? Yes, okay. definitely. I see lots of growth. Um, the kids now, like I said, what you saw on there with them knowing their vowels, knowing what a blend and digraph is, they didn't know that coming into first grade in years past. Knowing the different vowel sounds and even the different, the C and G, they blew me away when they said, well, that's a soft C or that's a hard G. So yes, I definitely see a difference. Also, in their writing, their writing and their spelling, I definitely see an improvement this year than in years past. Mm -hmm. And, and I gotta believe it's from the, the, the phonics program. Good, all right, and then I have one more question. To the students, are you enjoying it? Just <laughs> <laughs> you can speak now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of fun, learning a lot of good things. All right, keep up the good work. You're on TV. <laughs> yeah. Great, anyone else with a question? Kelly? Question. Thank you so much. I thought the video was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple little ones, so I have a quick question. So I know that it's being rolled out for second grade, but in terms of maybe a third grade or a second grader that need a little extra help, is it still being reinforced by like the reading specialist at that level? Are you going to dive in or is it just... Are you mm -hmm. talking about like in the upper grades? Yeah. So one of the beauties of the curriculum is that there are not just units of study for the particular grade level. But each um, unit or each grade level kit comes with a small group book, which has 75 to 80 different small groups that are specifically targeted to different phonics principles or different phonics elements. And what we've done is we've ensured that our special education teachers, even our third and fourth grade teachers who may have kids that have kind of missed this piece, they're able to get pieces of it through those small groups. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Great. Good question. Anyone else? I, I just, um, I want to thank you too on behalf of the board and, and teaching all those years too. I love teaching phonics. Of course, then you come to the word fatigue. 
and the kids would just look at you and I say, just say fatigue. It works beautifully. <laughs> but our English language is very challenging. So thank you very much for giving them a tool to learn it. Thank you. Thank you for your expertise. Students, thank you very much. And parents, thank yes, you. Well thank done. You. And now before the children go, I think I'd like them to stand. Can Hunter Hernandez, are you here? You want to stand? And Lena DeMonte, Joey DeMonte, well that name sounds familiar. <laughs> Oren Manushi, did I get you right? Maggie Manushi, um, Mirabella, help me with your last name, Mirabella. Thank you. And Holden Gallagher, great names. Jacks, oh, we have a Jackson. Jackson Bonal Bonaldo. Thank you. And Ray. Thank you all very much. You turn around. They want to take a picture. Turn around, guys. Look at your principal. And moms and dads, thank you very much for bringing them in. All right, thank you. That was cute. Good work. Thank you, ladies. I always say it's so hard to continue after that. <laughs> okay, next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for our board meeting on September 24th, 2019. Anyone see any corrections? No, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. A second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. So noted. Okay, those minutes are then approved. Is there anyone wishing to make a public comment? Please come on up to the podium and state your name and address. And may I remind you that for public comments, we limit it to five minutes. Okay, so, oh, good. Come on up. Do I have to state my name? Do I have to state my name? Say your name and address. Okay, I'm Colleen Matatal, 124 Wheeler Road. On behalf of the WSBC, I want to thank the board, Mr. Emmett, the principals, the social services staff, and the Weathersfield Public School staff for participating in something very dear to my heart, which is the Sandy Hook promise to say hello. Several schools um, participated in this last year, but this year we saw a dramatic increase sorry, um, in schools participating. Um, it's focusing on social inclusion by simply saying hello, sharing a smile. It can make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, with the support of Mr. Emmett, we saw that almost all the schools participated this year in the Starts With Hello Week. Some activities were coloring a word hello and making a mural. Um, that was at Hamner. Um, wearing name tags. Say hey day, which is talking to all the students. Um, and wear green to support the Sandy Hook promise. The WSBC, uh, the WSBC hopes to see activities like this throughout the year and for years to come. A special thanks to Dot DeVink for bringing this idea to the WSBC and to Mr. Emmett for listening, supporting, and striving for a more inclusive future. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Colleen. Mike. Thank you, Colleen. Anyone else? Okay, so Mr. Emmett, um, thank you for doing that too. You have some communication to share? I do, thank you, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening you'll hear a uh, little bit of a presentation from Erica Teixeira and Bonnie Smith concerning a proposed student survey that is on tonight's agenda uh, for students at the secondary level. Uh, this survey is similar in context to the ERASE survey that was administered back in 2016. Uh, this data assists us with identifying supports for our students and also helps 
with grant applications for program funding for future services for our students. Uh, this is a great partnership between the school district and the town. Uh, you have a copy of that draft um, survey uh, with you. This would be something that would be administered at both the <coughs> middle school and high school level. We'd be utilizing our technology to, uh, um, to implement that. Also this evening on the agenda is um, a series of policies that the Policy and Planning Committee had reviewed. Um, we have a couple that are still in progress, meaning that there are um, approvals to go this evening. Uh, the one with undirected play, so you know, is still one of those that we are working on. So we definitely want to have principals and our teachers weigh in about what that schedule would look like if we decided to add any additional undirected play. What would that come at the expense of? Um, in addition to that, so you know, Policy and Planning Committee, the latest batch of uh, updates from Shipman and Goodwin arrived yesterday. So we have a Policy and Planning Committee meeting coming up on the 21st of October. So we'll dig into those. And I should have data uh, around the undirected play from principals. I'll be meeting with them actually tomorrow, um, right after administrative team. Um, we've got an event coming up uh, next week on the 16th. The Weathersfield Eagles football team uh, will be uh, embarking on their tackle literacy program. They will be headed to Webb, Highcrest, and Hammer schools, heading into classrooms to support teachers in uh, reading and writing. So it's going to be a nice opportunity for our high school students to be able to give back and reconnect with their teachers at the elementary level. So it's coming up next Wednesday afternoon. I'll have more for you in the Friday update on that. Uh, we continue to monitor carefully the uh, process with Triple E. Um, as you probably know, we have approximately 20 towns here in Connecticut where Triple E has been identified. The closest town uh, to Wethersfield is South Windsor. Um, we continue to listen to the direction of the Central Connecticut Health District in terms of making informed decisions. Um, we did see a, a rather cold morning over the course of the weekend, and uh, we think that the activity is starting to wane at this point in time. Again, I would uh, urge all residents to continue to use necessary precautions. Um, should something change, obviously we'll communicate that in addition to um, that communication. We would also coordinate with the town as well. As you know, town activities are still going on as well, and we would make a decision that was um, cohesive between both town and school district. I've been keeping you up to date with regard to a couple of our ongoing building issues um, that we're facing. We have a, a pesky leak over in Emerson Williams in the music room. Uh, Tremco, the roofing company that is uh, contracted to uh, inspect and repair both town and school roofs, have been out multiple times and it still continues to be an issue. I was over in the music room today. We're currently not using it, so Miss Fortuna is adjusting and either going into classrooms or utilizing the upper section of the media center to provide music while we wait for this repair to be made. So um, I'm hopeful that Tremco will be out. Uh, unfortunately, we had like two solid weeks of quiet weather and Tremco was booked elsewhere. And I'm a little you know, nervous about some of the incoming weather here later on this week with a pretty significant rainstorm. Um, the other piece uh, building related that we're working on is a situation over at Highcrest in the first grade pod with regard to a plumbing leak that's uh, occurring behind the wall, within a wall between a bathroom and a first grade classroom. So at this point in time, we had water that was leaking through the wall into the classroom. We have shut the water off in that section and uh, we're expecting the plumber out uh, shortly to get that fixed. That's another priority. Um, we always talk about the buildings and all of the little negative things about the buildings. I do wanna say we had a member of the community reach out and send me an email uh, thanking the town for keeping the school grounds at Weathersfield High School looking so good. Uh, she goes for sporting events and has been very impressed with how the landscaping looks and how neat and clean and orderly things look at Weathersfield High School. Um, tomorrow at Webb, Sushi is coming uh, to read with the kids. Um, we have one of our employees who uh, has a dog who is a therapy dog, certified therapy dog. We've gone through all of our processes around Karma and making sure that we have the appropriate insurance. And uh, Sushi is certified, so Sushi will be visiting Web School tomorrow for the first time to read with our students. Um, we're looking at this as an opportunity for maybe some of those students that are struggling readers that feel a little bit self-conscious about reading. Sushi will be a good person, a dog person, uh, to be able to read to because she never judges. So we're looking forward to seeing sushi. 
Uh, and then at the next board meeting, a couple of uh, upcoming things um, in terms of goals and objectives, uh, be requesting an executive session at the next board meeting to um, present and go over my upcoming goals for the current year. In addition to that, uh, it's my expectation that I will bring before you an action item to set the 2019-2020 graduation date. Uh, legislation has changed where we are no longer bound by legislation to wait until after April 1st. So we would be able to set the date. This would be certainly good for uh, Project SafeGrad and getting things squared away. Um, right now at this point in time, the last day of school is Friday, June 12th. Yeah, Friday graduation day. Isaac, does that meet with your expectations? <laughs> yeah, I would think it would. So that's what we will uh, look to do with the meeting coming up on the uh, 24th. And with that, that is uh, communications. Thank you. Anyone have questions for Mr. Emmett? I just have one. Um, in light of the, the two um, problems with water, all problems with buildings ha have to do with water, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. How has the relationship with maintenance and custodial with the town um, taking the lead on that? How's that working? It's, it's working out well. I think the problem with the Emerson piece is that you're dealing with an outside contractor. So you're kind of at their beck and call when they can come out and fix. And it is not as if the town has ignored it. Tremco's been out multiple times and they think they have it fixed and then we get a rainstorm and it leaks again. And it's, um, they've traced it to a roof drain uh, I will include a picture of this roof drain. Remember, the roof drain dates back to about 1952. The work that we're doing with phase two, which we continue to work on about a long range plan for, for our buildings, this is another example of a building being extraordinarily tired. So um, I think the town has been responsive. I know that there's levels of frustration out in the schools. I talk with parents, I've talked with staff as well. Um, but I do think the town is working to try and, and resolve this. I do know that we've been shorthanded in the maintenance department as well. Our plumber has been out, so he's recently returned. So we know there was an issue with the high school and uh, bathrooms with Bradley sinks that needed to be addressed, and then Highcrest is next on the list. So thank you for the question. Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, tonight we have two action items. Ginger, would you read action item 6A for us? Yes. Uh, move that the Weathersfield Board of Education support the administration of the Youth Voices Count Survey in collaboration with the town of Weathersfield. Okay, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay, and any discussion? We had the survey in our packet. And also, can you come up and, oh, thank you. Good evening, uh, Board of Education members, Superintendent Emmett. My name is Erica Texera and I'm the Assistant Director of Social and Youth Services for the Town of Wethersfield. I come before you tonight to share with the Board of Education our department's proposal to once again administer an online and confidential youth needs assessment survey, which will be administered during the school day to all 7th through 12th graders that attend Silas Dean Middle School and Wethersfield High School. The first survey was done in fall of 2016, which allowed for us to collect valuable baseline data. We are currently looking to conduct this next survey in November of this year. Youth Services, in conjunction with the Weathersfield Youth Advisory Board, received a grant from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving Donor Advisory Fund to conduct the second Youth Needs Assessment Survey. The survey is to help the community leaders learn about youth experiences um, and feelings regarding substance use, depression, anxiety, social media, gaming, and gambling. By conducting this survey, Social and Youth Services is looking to solicit student input and perspective regarding substance use and at-risk behaviors and to use the data to best guide our future planning, especially around seeking out potential grant opportunities. We are looking to hire B. Whalen Smith Consulting, LLC, to administer the Youth Voice Count Survey Bonnie Smith, the same consultant we used for previous, our previous survey is here tonight to answer any specific questions regarding the survey. The implementation of the survey is a four-step process, one being communication to parents, two, conducting of the survey, three, data analysis, and four, reports and presentations. In conclusion, the results of the survey will guide the Weathersfield Department of Social and Youth Services as we plan to provide prevention programs for our youth and promote overall community awareness. 
I appreciate you allowing us to come here tonight and share an overview of the youth needs assessment process. And I will turn it over now to Bonnie Smith, the consultant. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. Erica really covered that so beautifully. I'm just here really to answer questions. Um, I do happen to be a mom in town, um, coincidentally. Weathersfield, uh, as you know, did the survey back in 2016 through ERACE. ERACE merged with another entity back in the spring of 2019. At that time, they discontinued their survey services. As a consultant that utilizes survey data in a number of different communities across the state, I felt it was important to find a way to continue with that particular survey tool to allow for ongoing evaluation and planning. Uh, so I purchased the rights to the ERACE survey tool um, and have since enhanced the tool to be more encompassing of an overall spectrum of behavioral health and social um, issues concerning social media, online gaming, as Erica said. So the survey is completely comparable with prior years administration. It's just expanded to bring in some other subject matter that we know are really crucial issues. Um, you do have a copy of both the survey and a potential add-on section that addresses some other issues. And it's entirely up to all of you as you work with youth services to determine if indeed you want those add-on questions and if so, what grade levels you'd like to do that with. Okay. Any questions from Bonnie, Diane? What, um, in 2016, what were there, after that survey, was there anything implemented? Did that survey and that data direct youth services or the high school to add in any programmatic changes or? So we definitely took the data um, and looking at as um, baseline data because we never had done a survey before, which was pretty favorable to the um, community. We have looked to implement some prevention work with um, participating and collaborating with the DARE officers and all the DARE graduations, as well as partner with some um, uh, programs at the high school as well as the middle school. We tweaked our after school programming a little bit and we also participated in a police and youth grant program, which was very successful, as well as a few of the things that we, um, but with this, we're hoping that it will open doors to bigger grants in the future, in the near future, that would allow us to build our capacity with providing prevention work. Okay, anyone else? Kevin? Um, I just wanna confirm that it's uh, obviously anonymous by students, and also um, if parents choose to, if, if they allow their student to opt out. Uh, so there's a passive consent process. I provide a sample that you can alter as a school district in whatever way you prefer. So that means um, the passive consent notification goes home to all parents in whatever means you do that at the middle and high school. And parents can, by a certain date, choose to not have their child participate. Um, and in addition, parents can choose to review the survey tool. I request that it not be provided online just for survey fidelity purposes. Um, but they could always come into a main office and review the survey tool before they determine their choice for their child. Um, additionally, youth do not have to participate. We don't want to say to youth, do it or don't do, do it, but it is absolutely optional. And the way that I administer the survey behind the scenes, I can select that IP addresses are not identified, which really further de-identifies the data right down to students using certain Chromebooks, et cetera, in the schools. I really, from both sides, we don't want to know what student responses are. Okay. Anyone else? John? When do you think this is going to be able for Weathersfield students to take? Oh, um, well, Erica has asked if we are indeed approved to move forward, that it be implemented in November and it will be ready. Um, the questions that I've recently added have come from other validated tools. I will be doing some focus groups over the next week or so. I have one tomorrow evening with middle and high school youth in a neighboring community. I really just want to make sure some of the terminology really uh, is comfortable for the youth that are going to be taking the survey with some of the new indicators um, in addition. And I also plan to meet with an internet safety specialist and have his take on how we've worded some of the questions around social media and online gaming. Um, and that will occur this week as well. So 
the tool that you have in front of you is 99% final. I just can foresee potentially minor wording changes according to focus group outcomes and other specialist input. And then how would this be disseminated to the community? How, how is this gonna get out to students in grades seven through 12? Um, and Mr. Emmett, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we are looking to use Chromebooks um, during advisory periods um, to um, reach the, the, the youth um, in seventh through 12th grade. Is that correct? Yeah, that's accurate. And then what we would look to see, John, once the results come out, we would have a presentation here at the board meeting as we did with the array survey. We actually had a hard copy of that and it provided us some really good mm -hmm. quality data. And again, data that I, you know, I had my prediction and my perception of what the biggest issue would be at the high school and the erase data was a little different than what I anticipated. So um, I think this is, a, it's again, we have good baseline data and Erica talked about the idea of looking for grant funds that directly aligns with goal three of our strategic plan. So, um, and again, I think the idea here is the anonymity is important, um, but it's always important to get that data to show where we need to um, push our resources. So, And, and then, um, I know the middle school and the high school have focus groups already. I know Isaac is the current president of the high school senior class, mm -hmm. and they have student councils, and so does the middle school. Has this been given to them now, not to take, but to review, to see whether or not there are questions that are valid for today's youth? So we did not give it to um, at, um, any of those groups that you mentioned, but we did go through the Youth Advisory Board, which has youth from um, mostly right now it's the high school, and they were able to view it as well um, and add any input. Okay, so there's what, how many students got to see that? Probably like four or five. Four or five. And that, and Bonnie's doing it with um, groups of surrounding yeah. towns. As I would well. just, I mean, my own perception, I know there's some real uh, positive groups mm -hmm. that both the middle school and the high school, um, you know, they're into it. And, you know, there's a few, you know, good individuals, four or five on the youth advisory. But are you aware of that, this survey being out there other than seeing it on the board right now? Um, Mr. Emmett mentioned it to me a couple, I think it was last week at the other meetings. <clears throat> but besides that, I was not aware of this. So I just think that if, we're, if we want it to be positive, then we've got to, get to the base of what we want to do, because it's just gonna be another survey. And so I, I think that's a great focus for when, uh, to, to piggyback when the results come in to really take on these focus groups um, with the students that are in the middle school and the high school. I think that's great, yeah. And I just think prior to the, the, the survey being done, it should be given, let them know. I, I just think you're gonna spin your wheels. Can I speak to that also, Mr. Cassio? Um, I would be reluctant to have too many students within the district so close to survey administration time. Look in detail at the survey tool at this time, again, to just maintain fidelity of the implementation process. Because um, what we wouldn't want to occur prior to implementation is any sort of discussion about the survey and survey responses among the small groups or larger groups of students, which is why tomorrow night, for example, I'm going next door to Rocky Hill, because they have no implementation plans at this time. So I'll get feedback from 20 youth, okay. grades seven through 12. I love, in my work, I do a lot of community participatory research, and absolutely, you have to have youth or whatever your population is involved in development of your tool, and certainly dissemination of results. In fact, the last question in the tool is asking youth, would they like to know what comes of the survey? Because I wanna know, do they care? And I hope they do, I think they will. And um, I'm hoping we can use groups such as this to sit down and look at data when it comes out and say, does this ring true for you? Why do you think this is this way? Why might it be different? What could we look at differently? And that's where Weathersfield specific youth will be absolutely ideal and serve the process well. Is there a certain amount that need to continue to do the survey to make it um, valid? 
Well, last time we had 87.5% of youth in grades 7 through 12, which is a wonderful response wow, rate. That's a good number. Um, so Erica and I have talked a little bit behind the scenes about means of making sure youth feel comfortable with the survey when it's time to implement, as well as take it seriously. There are things we do behind the scenes when we look at the data to determine if a student maybe didn't take the tool seriously and they're removed from the sample. But we don't want to have to see too much of that. What we'd like to do, and do you want to speak to that piece, Erica, about the video? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we look, um, since our youth advisory board is kind of where we're looking to get a lot of feedback and the, the support for uh, the survey, we have used some of the students um, to actually, there's the channel at the high school to disseminate information. And they're hearing it from their peers. So. Um, people they look up to and also that they um, are understanding that this is important and what we need and what would like to see um, use for the data. And I would say that the expectation, John, to your point about making sure the kids know, this wouldn't be something where it would be, you know, you're going to advisory on Wednesday and it's the first you're hearing about it and you're taking it. I think it's something that we need to make sure that the student body knows both at the middle school and the high school in advance understanding why we're getting this data, how we want you to take it seriously, how it is anonymous, so that we can get a, a valid sample size. An 87.5% you know, completion rate, that's, I mean, generally with the survey, you're looking, what, 30% is about what you'll get, most surveys? Um, this is a captive audience, so we would definitely want to see 60 or more, but 87.5 okay. is fantastic. Really good. excellent. Yeah. Okay, we have Ginger. Um, I have a sort of a follow-on to John's questions about the presentation of the survey to um, the kids. Um, having read the questions, the questions are important, but they're sensitive. Mm -hmm. And um, who's training the teachers who are giving it and presenting it to them? That's a great question. So the teacher's buy-in and teacher's comfort in administering, not really so much the tool, because they're not doing anything other than instructing. They're the, introducing it. Exactly. Um, is huge. I have a script that has been in place for a long time that is available for you as a district to look at and revise accordingly, and a lot of it comes from the top down. I've been in communities in past years where the administrators in the building didn't necessarily feel strongly that this was an important use of time. So as a result, their staff didn't as well. And you could see it in low response rates and incomplete surveys overall or inaccurate answers. So having staff advised from the top down that this is important, this is gonna take 20 minutes or less, the data are gonna be used in these ways, it's anonymous, et cetera, is really important. So I do have a script, and as Erica was touching upon, we're hoping that we can have this video that explains directly to youth hey, you're gonna take a school survey today. It's anonymous, it's voluntary, et cetera, from someone in the community, um, a student ideally, saying, hey, we're gonna do this, and it, this is why, in a quick 60-second video. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I have a few. Uh, first of all, when do we get the report back if we go through all this? Because this information, I do think, is very valuable. These children are living in a time that's so complicated and so complex. The more information we have on them, the more valuable um, we, it is. Um, so when would we get the reporting back? So we plan on eight weeks. Eight weeks? It, it okay. could be less, but we're gonna say eight to start. Okay, as long as it's, you know, I, I love the SBACs, we get them the next year, yeah. you know. <laughs> but um, the other thing too, we have the optional survey section. Mm -hmm. um, we just passed, or we're going to pass a, or work on, a bullying policy, and I see that they have bullying and harassment. How do we ask for those? How do we have those put into the survey as a board? Oh, well, you all can talk to Mr. Emmett about what you'd like or not like to be included, and as Mr. Emmett and Erica communicate that, Erica is the liaison with me, and I will okay. make a Weathersfield-specific tool Perfect. with those add-on sections. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, so we'll take a vote on this. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion 6A passes. Thank you, Erica. Thank, Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, ladies. Good evening.
Okay, motion 6B, um, Chris Healy is our chair of policies and he's not here tonight, so I'll read it. The recommended motion for 6B is move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve the proposed legislative policy updates. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay, and we'll have discussion on this. And Mr. Emmett, you had some words about this, but go ahead, Diane. The, um, the physical, the first concern I have is about the physical activity and directed play in student discipline. That policy speaks specifically to um, disciplinary action and discipline um, regarding um, deprivation of these uh, periods. The paragraph, the administration may include additional time beyond the 20 minutes required for physical exercise devoted to undirected play during the regular school day for elementary students. That should really be in a separate policy that talks about physical activity, undirected play, the definitions of it, what um, the guidance for it, those types of things. Because this policy specifically is regarding the discipline of um, holding that back. So I, I think that we should um, amend that to take that paragraph out and have that paragraph in a whole separate policy that we do that discusses undirected play, physical activity, like I said, the definitions. Um, and I believe, um, Mr. Emmett, you were getting some feed, you were gonna get some feedback back from um, some of the teachers and Correct. so forth, which would be in an entirely separate policy regarding Make the wholeness of undirected play and physical activity. But this is just about the discipline aspect of it. Anyone else with a comment on this? I agree with Diane. Well, I think it should be two separate policies, one just dealing with the discipline that you can't hold back recess for any reason, whether it be the structured recess for the gym teacher or the recess at lunchtime, and that be policy XYZ, whatever the number is Diane has there. And then the second one, when we get the information that Mr. Emmett's asking of the staff and um, of legal, and we could make a policy on undirected play, I, or unstructured play, is it undirected? They're calling it undirected. Undirected, I wasn't yeah. sure which one. <laughs> but I think that's the way to go. Then you have two very clear, the same policies. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's interesting, this is the one that, um, you know, I'm such a proponent of play for children and unstructured play is what they've always called it. Now it's undirected. But if, as we read through this policy, we also were told that the General Assembly is going to have a task force or a group that's going to look at the definition of undirected play um, and what it means. And if you read all the research on it, they do want children out there with nobody really refereeing them, you know, they're not following something on their um, iPad. It's completely their creative play. Um, so I, I have a, I just have a problem with it just as administration, but then I work on the leader-leader model and I said then that would get down to the teachers too. I would like to see uh, more emphasis on undirected play and perhaps a separate policy on this deprivation of physical activity as two separate um, well, would be very policies. clear then, Father, a teacher, mm. a new teacher, young teacher coming in can, can go and see what uh, the undirected play means without, oh, am I right or am I wrong? Am I right? Mm. You know, it would be very clear that way, I think. Yeah, and I think the idea of, you know, getting the perspective from teachers and administrators, mm -hmm. and now when we had our last policy committee meeting, um, Kelly, you brought up the question about brain breaks, and, you know, I talked about yoga, and we had the question of, well, is that really undefined play? You also have the issue of, with the schedule that we have, where, where does this, well, how, first, how much additional time? I'm interested to understand what staff are thinking about that. And what does that come at the expense of? So we've got some questions to go through here. And then the other piece here, as I go out and make my rounds in the school buildings, I know that there are teachers that will utilize um, time like on Friday at Hammer, Fun Friday. So that's an earned opportunity where that is undirected play. They are in the classroom and they are engaged in coloring. They may be playing with blocks on the floor and they are totally on their own. There are other aspects um, like school-based programs like jogathons. Most of our elementary schools will do a jogathon. That will encompass the better part of a day 
between grade levels going out. So I want to be careful that those meaningful programs in our elementary schools are not sacrificed. So I, I am fully behind, you know, parsing this one out, uh, meeting the mandate within the policy as it is around the discipline piece, but parsing this out, getting some feedback from our leadership teams, our administration, and then getting together again as a policy committee and wrapping something up that is separate from this discipline piece. Right. Um, and Mr. Wright, I agree with you on um, a lot of it. I don't agree with you on the fact that a Friday afternoon where the kids are sitting around and working is um, unstructured or undirected play. I did look it up because, as I told you, it's a focus of mine. It is synonymous with unstructured. It means it's not directed or guided. And I continue to look through it. And undirected play with others allows children to learn how to work as a team, to share, to negotiate, to listen, to resolve conflicts. Self-driven play also lets kids practice their decision-making skills, explore their imagination and creativity, and discover new interests. And I do find that this undirected, unstructured play really has a place in our um, social and emotional curriculum. And I did find a marvelous quote, it happened to come from a very smart man, Albert Einstein, who said that play is the highest form of research. And it really does allow our children to do their creative research. Um, so I really would like this um, to be looked at more. And um, I don't think it has to be in place of something else. I think teachers are very savvy in directing their day. And when you see your group in front of you has just lost it, <laughs> Um, then they need some unstructured, undirected play, some way to let themselves um, get back into focus. Um, so I would like to have this looked at again, if we could. Send it, send it back to policy. Yeah, I think we should send this back to policy. No, yep. I mean, I think we could just make a motion to remove that paragraph and then accept everything else. Correct. Because would you like that? That would yeah, be the way I'll, to go? Because I'll that covers the component of the discipline. That's piece. required. Yep. So I would make a motion that um, okay. policy number 550, physical activity, undirected play and student discipline, be adopted with the removal of the paragraph, the administration may include additional time beyond the 20 minutes required for physical exercise devoted to undirected play during the regular school day for elementary school students and be included in an, another policy. In a separate policy. Separate mm -hmm. policy. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion on that, or can we vote on that motion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? So the amendment to our physical activity, undirected play, and student discipline policy has passed. Thank you. All right. So moving back. So that was the amendment, and now we need the underlying Now we have to go back to the underlying policy. Right. Underlying policy. So back to the original policy of move that the Weathersfield Board of Ed approve the proposed legislative policy updates. Oh, um, hang on. Are, okay. I was just talking about that one. I have a comment about another one, too. Go ahead. Because um, the there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's a lot of them, and I don't know if I can find it because there's so many here. But the one about bullying, mm -hmm. um, I had brought to the, to the Policy and Planning Commission committee meeting um, that if we're going to have a policy on bullying, it can't just be for students. It's got to be for everybody. And I know that we, we include the language about um, the staff, the discipline, if the policies aren't followed. But, I mean, there really needs to be a pop, there really needs to be something in there about bullying that occurs um, by adults, um, teachers, staff, coaches. Um, those types of things because I mean it's got to be both ways it can't just be kids it's, it's got to include um, staff as well and I noticed that language um, wasn't included in this and I think it's very important that that be in there too and it also um, gives the kids the perception that everyone's held to that standard um, and not just them okay any other discussion on this with Diane, I think we had um, some very tense issues with coaches this past spring, and I think it would be very wise for us to put into this policy um, or amend it somehow to include any adult 
or um, as she said, staff or coach, anybody working with our children need to be held to the same standard as the children do in terms of bullying. So I don't, I don't know if we should send it back to policy for adding on or make another policy called poli uh, uh, policy for bullying with adults. I don't know, that's the best route for me. I'd, I'd suggest sending that one back to the policy committee because as I had mentioned earlier, I think this is something that needs a look by our council. That's right. I yes. wanna be cautious with this because you're also talking about an issue around human resources mm -hmm. and that is outside of the purview of the board. We set the policy. I wanna make sure we set a policy that, that covers us and does not open us up to any liability. So my suggestion on that one would be let's table that one and let's bring that one back to policy and have a look at that. And in the meantime, would you speak to Shipman and Goodman to for get some guidance for us, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yep. thank you. Absolutely. Okay, any other discussion on our policy? So we're gonna remove that one. That one's removed. Do we have a motion to remove that one? I'll make a motion to remove, I don't know which number it is. Um, um, I don't need that. We can look it up. Um, to remove the policy, to table the policy of it's in the five um, thousands, I know the that five thousands regarding bullying, um, and refer it back to the um, policy and planning committee. So we'll okay. second that. Is there a second on that? Okay. Any discussion? Any further discussion? And we know which one we're talking about. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that. Now we've got two motions on this one. Any others on any of the other policies we looked at? Class 51, that's that one. Class House Neiman? 5150. 5150. Ellen, did you get that? 5150. Page 994. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it a, lo it was a lot, it was a lot. 213 pages. John's volunteering to be on policy and planning. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> Good word, Smith, John. Still there, John, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? So we can go back to our original proposal here, move that the Wessel Board of Ed approve the proposed legislative policy update with those two motions. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so motion 6B passes. So was there any other? You, you just included all the other policies then? Yeah, yep, okay. Okay. all the other ones were included now. The I have is Thank who you. moved and who seconded because we, <coughs> we did an amendment and then we're tabling There were portions. two amendments. Right. So The original motion was by Bobby. Yeah, and okay. I seconded it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. It went fast. Don't get into that early. <laughs> My head was like a ping pong ball. I want you to have so many papers here. I know. <laughs> Our annual class size. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so we have a report tonight. Mr. Emmett, I believe, yes. is doing it on the annual class size as of October 1st, 2019. Thank you, Michael.
Um, common. All right, we got it. All right, well, thank you again, everyone. Uh, good evening. This is our annual look at our uh, class size uh, for, for both elementary and secondary uh, for 2019-2020. This is done in conjunction with our annual submission to the state of the PSIS, the Public School Information System. Uh, PSIS is uh, due in theory on October 1st. The state's extended that deadline to the 15th, so we're in the final throes of gathering up all of our data to submit to the state. This October 1st count is obviously very important in terms of our enrollment, in terms of funding, and um, we must submit this to the state. So our table of contents, the, the um, context of this is the same as it's been uh, for all of my years as superintendent. So we talk about elementary, middle school, and high school um, sections, along with our transition academy as well. So here's the, the count. This is the comparison. So as a district here in Wethersfield for the Wethersfield Public Schools, we uh, last year on October 1st had 3,588 students. This year, as of October 1st, 2019, we are at 3,580 students. So we've seen a net loss of a total of eight students. It's interesting when you look, you see early intervention pre-K. Our pre-K numbers are up uh, compared to last year. Our elementary numbers are down compared to last year. And part of that is consistent with our phase one enrollment report where we talked about kindergarten numbers being down mm -hmm. over the next two years and then they start to bump up again. The middle school I had mentioned earlier that we saw an increase in students specifically in grade seven. We're still working on the whys, where did they come from? But we went from 535 students last year to 567. When we did an analysis, we had an increase of 33 grade seven students compared to last year and a decrease of eight eighth graders. And then our numbers at Wethersfield High School went up slightly to a total of 1144. Our transition academy, we've seen a decrease there. Um, we had a large number of students that aged out last year and graduated from the program. They met the um, age of 21. So they made that transition to adult services or the working world. Um, so a, as a total, 3,580. And Mike, Mike, sure. On the transition academy, are all six of those children Wethersfield children? Or all Wethersfield. Okay. Good question. All Wethersfield students. So as you can see, the breakdown of classes, um, what we did, and you recall from budget times, we knew we were going to have a large number of uh, kindergarten students at Highcrest. So as part of the budget, you um, had requested that fourth section of kinder. Uh, that fourth section was certainly needed. So what we've done elsewhere in some of our other schools, we've seen a decrease in sections. So we were able to absorb elsewhere. So we saw a decrease in a section at Charles Wright. That offsets the increase in the section at Highcrest. And then we had some movement at Hanmer where people stayed at Hanmer, but they moved to different grade levels based upon the, the need. I have a question on this page, Mike. Sure. Um, I, I see the STRIVE program, and am I reading it correctly that in Hamner, there are two STRIVE children that are grade two and one in grade three? That is correct. And they are, are they mainstreamed into those grades or are they both mostly housed just in Hamner? Great question. What, what happens with them is they have a self-contained classroom. Right, I saw that. However, wherever they have the opportunity to mainstream with their typical peers, that's what they do. Mrs. Okay. Granado can attest to that. We had a visit over to Hanmer last week. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, they were working on a project outside. They were painting. And uh, the STRIVE program was included within that activity. No, I'm all for the program. I just wanted to make sure I was seeing this right, that they're integrated into just grade three when possible. Absolutely. Same thing with grade two. There's two integrated in Correct. the Correct. And that's also indicative not only of the STRIVE program, Elaine, but the ABA program as well. So it is a self-contained program where they get the ABA supports, but wherever they have the ability to, whether it be eating in the cafeteria, participating in specials, going out at, at recess, they will be integrated into mainstream classroom with adult support. Yep. That's the other key piece. So here's our list. This is where we're at. This is a familiar slide. You see this over the course of the summer. Uh, we have broken out the uh, STRIVE and the ABA programs. 
So you can see. And this year, unlike how many other years have we had it where we were dealing with 26 or 27 in a classroom? Uh -huh. we're, we're pretty stable at the elementary level at this point in time. And here's our average class sizes and our range. So in terms of the number of classes at 26 or higher at the elementary level, we have not seen a class size that high in the past four years. And again, I think one of the things to look at when you look at table three and you look at the average class size, we do have disparity between the elementary schools. When I've got Highcrest, for example, with over 400 students, and I've got Charles Wright and Webb with a fraction of that, that's one of the things that that phase two um, process, when we wrap that up, is going to be able to address through redistricting as part of the long-range building plan. So we can make our school districts more equitable across all, um, all of our schools. Here's our middle school. And you can see the numbers here with regard to our levels with language arts and math. One of the things I want to bring your attention to in terms of phys ed, you know, there are implications when we have those budget reductions. And one of the reductions we had mm -hmm. was we lost a phys ed teacher at the middle school. So you think about it, you had three phys ed teachers covering all of those sections. You lost one, and that position moved over to the high school to cover a retirement, and then you added 33 additional seventh graders. So you can see here there is a, a real kind of a bubble there in terms of uh, the number of kids in that particular program. And again, the numbers with our language, our, our world language, excuse me, the world language numbers are robust pretty much across the board. You know, one of the things that you'll notice, you'll see a lot of Spanish and very few French. That was one of the reasons why we were looking at potentially phasing French out. Our numbers continue to actually be quite low. And here we are for grade eight. So, and I will say the the leadership team and the administration at the middle school has done great work in trying to balance these classes out as best as possible. And then here are our grade seven and grade eight class sizes. And you'll notice, again, indicative of the piece at the middle school with the loss of that gym teacher, the number of classes with 30 or more students has gone up pretty dramatically. Ms. Dermott. Yes. Um, am I correct in saying that in general, um, the classes, the, um, I guess, or educational classes are less than 30? That is correct. So if you look and you see, for example, we have it broken out by team. So for grade eight, our Indigo team, uh, the highest we see there, we have a level one language arts class of 26. We have a language arts level one class of 25 from the Magenta. And then when we get into the elective, so for example, Italian, I've, I only got one section of Italian and that's at 30. And then our Spanish classes are all, with the most part, are all very well subscribed. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. About the, um, that's just a lot of people to be in a gym class at once, the our teacher. Um, are there other, like there's gotta be other people helping them out, right? I mean, or is it just them with 30 kids? It's, it's two of the teachers with the 30 kids. And what they've tried to do is where they have students with special needs and have paras, they've tried to float the paras in to provide that support. Um, but again, when the resources are slim, that's yeah. the difficult piece. The other thing I want to draw your attention to also, uh, down on the bottom of pa table five, you have the human relations. The human relations course, that's our middle school component of STRIVE that we were able to, and now how did we get that program? Well, we took a uh, special ed teacher from the high school, which is certainly impacting us at the high school level, but moved that position down to the middle school. So that individual is working with a group of students that need that level of support, structure, and therapy. So they will spend time in the human resources classroom or human relations classroom, excuse me, and then they will also go out into the mainstream environment um, to the extent that it's, it's possible. 
Okay, so here again, our, our average class size at the middle school has gone up. Part of that is indicative of the uh, reduction in staff and the increase in students. And then here we are at the high school. So you can see our numbers are, are pretty robust here. Where you get into some of the smaller numbers are um, some of our electives and some of our specialized classes. question on page 11 Mike on my sure. the reading lab and if I remember that's reading 180 correct it's it's yeah, the, the old read 180, 180 course yes yeah. yeah. so that particular program is for students that require additional right. um, I, I support okay. yes all right I just wondered if and and do they spend may I ask are they spend more than just one period in there if I'm correct sometimes it's an, I think a little I think they stay there longer because they have an individualized program in reading 180. It's what will happen there. It will depend upon the IEP. Oh, okay. So That's if right. the IEP calls for that amount right. of time, right. they'll be there for that. Um, in some cases, we'll utilize uh, uh, co-taught classrooms mm -hmm. so the child can get the special ed support in a co-taught classroom with the regular ed and the certified okay. special ed teacher as well. Mm -hmm. just Michael, just to comment in you sure. on the high school class sizes. I um, those um, classes that we were told about in language arts or English, America Through the Eyes of Women, Cultural Changes in America, Race in America, they're there, and I'm very glad to see it, and they seem to be robust numbers there. Absolutely. And the other thing, I did have a, um, an opportunity, I think it was a year or two ago now, to talk to teachers at the high school in a group with town more we, mm -hmm. we had a group together and I, there were classes at that time of 30 and I said to him how do you do this how do you do a class of 30 and their response made me feel fabulous all other so people should they said the students were so well behaved that it was really it was the, the amount of work they had to do which was problematic it wasn't so much the behavior mm -hmm. or crowd control as we all say in the elementary grades um, so I'm glad to see the class size is lower, but even when they were that high, the students were um, very well behaved. And it, it's interesting to, to your point, Mrs. Granado. You, know, you look at the programs like Shakespearean studies, and you know you've got a class of 20 studying Shakespeare. That's nice. I like to see that. And our journalism, you know, you've got journalism one and two. You've got large numbers there, and I can tell you that's yeah. taught by. Um, our good friend John Martin, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, there is a lot of rigor there. And to give our kids the opportunity to explore these different mm -hmm. courses, I think, is critical. It's great to hit the basics, but to be able to cover some of the, you know, the arts. Uh, one of the courses that I think uh, is very popular is Film as Literature. Again, 24 and 22 in two sections. So they're always talking about that one. So, uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Is there so AP French? I know French had come up. It says there's two <laughs> students in there. That's is correct. Is there like legit just a class of two students? So what we've done that with that? Handled? Good question. Um, as you know, the oh, French teacher was on the block and it was on the reduction list, and then it was it was saved. We went out a couple of times looking for a French teacher. They are hard to come by. So what we ended up doing was we took an existing dual certified teacher who was both French and Spanish and moved that individual out of the Spanish courses to teach French and then we hired a Spanish teacher to take on all of those Spanish courses. So I am able to cover all of the courses with the exception of AP French. So what we have done in the past, you know Edgenuity. Edgenuity has been our credit retrieval program for our kids that are struggling in achieving credits. Edgenuity also has the ability where it has online coursework. So those two students are actually getting AP French through an online experience. Now with that online experience, I'm speaking from experience as a parent, um, more and more of our students are going off to college and they are not getting seat time with a professor. They're getting an online course because colleges and universities are struggling to find 
and the cost of hiring professors has been difficult. So the idea of giving these kids the experience of managing an online class, and it does have the support at the high school, so there's still a, a tutor there that supports them in the process, and Edgenuity provides a certified teacher to provide the content for these kids. So that's how we were able to solve that issue. But, well, that's, again, the team at the high school. I, I thought it was a, a unique situation, and it was, again, having the resources like with the Edgenuity. The Edgenuity program has been great for our kids that are struggling to make up credits. It's all about giving kids a chance. So, and for this, even with our AP French students, we're seeing a lower number of kids engaged in French, but to be able to still provide an opportunity for our kids at that level, I'm, I'm very pleased. Okay, so here are more class sizes. John, John has. Oh, I'm sorry, question. go ahead, John. Um, with regards to the high school, and you know, it's I noticed that we have uh, AP Biology, Honors Level One and Level Two, mm -hmm. but in Chemistry we have AP Chemistry, but no Honors or Level Ones or Twos. Is there reasons for that? Yeah, it's called uh, not enough teachers. Okay, That's, and, and it's interesting you bring that question up because that is the exact same thing I talked about with our parents at our last WSPC meeting. So if we had enough staffing to add the honors chemistry so I could have AP chemistry, honors chemistry, and level one, we'd certainly love to do it. But if a student is in AP chemistry, can they opt to take honors or level one with that, within that confine of the class of the 17 students? Is that an option for them? I, I don't think it is. I'd have to defer to, to, to I, I'm not thinking that that's an option. It's either AP or it isn't. Okay. Now, you know, sometime, and Sally's in the back there, I'd love to talk at Student Program and Services about online courses, and in, uh, because then the world is open to us. But do we have to have, it's gonna sound like a ridiculous question, do we have to have an adult in the room? Do they have to, that's a requirement. You will absolutely want to have an adult supporting. And the other piece too we need to be careful of is our contractual obligations as well. Right. So with, with unions. So I'm, I'm looking here, could, could we ever have Mandarin? You know, you hear about, uh, but we could. Potentially. Okay. Yeah, good point. So yeah, and John, to that point, I, I had uh, heard that question from our WSPC just last week. And you know, I'd love to be able to offer up additional opportunities between ECE to do honors, to do AP. And then I, the questions that the parents have, well, why don't we do honors in lieu of AP? Well, I've got kids going on that track where they're looking for AP everything. So it's difficult. I'd love to have more resources. So that's a, a budget, uh, budget piece we need to put down. But, but at this point, the uh, instructor can't be creative enough to do the different leveling in one class? Yeah, that's, that's especially with an AP situation, no, we wouldn't be able to do that. Now, with that being said, John, if you have a student who is uh, in a level one and is advanced and is doing and wants to do work beyond, we're hoping that our teacher will differentiate instruction and provide that person with some additional work to do. So, but again, the idea of it going on a transcript as an honors chemistry class, we couldn't do that. And then we're down to some of our smaller courses here. Spanish, world language. There was a question brought up with regard to, uh, Elaine had brought up a, a good question under family consumer science about culinary arts being 16 and 14. Elaine, you did culinary arts? Is that no, I, 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 was, I was wondering, we did the kitchen over so beautifully there with the state of the art, and I said only 30 kids, and then Mike re steered into, no, that's the nutrition food you were thinking, and I, the, the culinary arts are kids who want to go on and on in this field. Yeah, so the, if, if you look at the food, the food and nu nutrition and food technology, we have three sections, 22, 21, 21. So that's the, that's the low level, that's the base course. And then for those students that want to go to the next level, um, that's the culinary arts program, and we have 16 and 14. And that type of a course, I like the lower numbers because that means more kitchen time, 
more time with the, st with the teacher Keep it focused, focused, and good outcomes. So. No, and I'm glad to see that we, when we put the money into the buildings and put money into that kitchen, which is phenomenal. Or Absolutely. You call it a kitchen. That's state of the art. It's not like my kitchen, but um, it's being used. That's what I, my eye went to the culinary. That's state right. of the art. Yeah. So, oh, Elaine, when was the last time you turned your stove on? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go on to the next page. Uh, here we have uh, tech ed. Again, our numbers in tech ed, I, I'd love to be able to expand. I know student programs and services, you're going to hear from uh, a couple of gentlemen from uh, Goodwin College about you know, what they can um, do to enhance what we already offer. Uh, we see some good numbers right there. Um, and then Jim, uh, he and Jim Health, PE, uh, the one number that <laughs> stuck out, which one of your colleagues mentioned to me, was the uh, size of four for PE 11. Um, what, that is an actual for that section. That is a morning section. Mm -hmm. And what we surmise may have happened there, it may have been more highly subscribed, and then they realized it was period two, and they have the ability to come in later because it's an upper class level upperclassmen group, uh, so they may have swapped out uh, for another time later in the day. Now with that particular section, we did um, project out to the spring because this is half year. Uh, there are 17 for the spring semester for that one, so that's that piece. And then again, the arts, well subscribed. You know, AP art, obviously, that's the, the your upper level course. There was a question also about concert band versus concert and marching band. Those are different courses. The concert and marching band has an additional .25 credit to it. So those are the kids that march and also participate in concert band. The concert band is just a concert band alone, not affiliated with the marching band. And again, concert choir numbers, we have, we have quite a few. The electronic music production, uh, that is another one uh, that with two sections, 28 involved in that. That electronic music um, program that we built through the high school project, they love it. Very, very popular. And again, these are other programs within. So our ELL program, we have 38 uh, ELL students at the high school. We have six that are currently going to, they split their time half between Weathersfield High School and half a day at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. Our ALS program has 12, um, and that program is our adaptive living skills program. So as those students move along, they may ne feed next up into our Weathersfield Transition Academy. So those will be students that would get services right up through age 21. And then last but not least is ADP, that's our alternate day program, and that's a, a program supporting our um, students uh, in Weathersfield High School. It is a self-contained program, yet again, as the IEP states, to the extent that they can get out with typical peers and go to mainstream classes, they're out in the mainstream environment. Michael, could you just explain sure. again what GHAA means? The that's, half day? that's the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. I got you. Okay. So, yeah, we'll have kids that will come in in the morning and have a, a half day of course load with us at Weathersfield High School, and then mm -hmm. they'll go to Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts for the afternoon. Good. Yep. Just didn't know the acronym. Okay. And then here are our class sizes. Class sizes have really been consistent at Weathersfield High School. And then you see our, our large numbers in, in table number 10. You know, the large numbers are where you want them in music. And then our transition academy. So we currently have no out-of-district students, they're all Weathersfield students. And then what we'll do over the course of this year is we develop IEPs for our students for next year in the ALS program. We will start to transition some of those students from the ALS program where they'll spend part of their day at the ALS program at Weathersfield High School. They'll spend the other half of the day over at the Transition Academy. So. And with that, that is the class size report. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, everyone. Thank you.
going to, and we have none yet. Gotcha. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. So we have no scheduled Board of Ed meetings that were held, but there are many on the upcoming schedule. And um, I'll read those off right now. We have Community and Public Relations Committee, which has a very meaty menu, as I told you. And that's on um, October 10th at 6 o'clock. Student Program and Services is on October 15th at 6.30. Correct okay. yep. Council is on October 16th at 11.30. Policy and planning is on October 21st at 6.30. And finance and information is right before our next board meeting on October 22nd at 6.15. Is there any unfinished business? Okay. Is there anyone wishing to come up to the podium? Please state your name and address, and may I remind you that your public comments are limited to five minutes. Okay, are there any board comments? Um, I have a school update. Oh, you, you're supposed to wait to the end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're, ju you're jumping the gun here. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'll save it for the very end, okay? All right. All right. Anyone else? All right. I do have an, um, I want to mention two things. On Thursday, September 26th, the Weathersville Education Foundation had its first meeting for the 2019-20 school year. The foundation's board continues to work to enrich and enhance our school's curriculum through private donations, working with alumni, businesses working with our schools, and through grants. The date for the annual meeting will soon be announced, and at that time, a new board, there will be elections. If you are interested, anyone, in working with this energetic group as a board member, please contact Sue Finelli or the Weathersfield Education Foundation website for, for more information. As I say, that board members can't be on it. And the Keene Foundation continues with its incredible funding of our after-school programs. Their big fundraiser is on October 18th, 19th, and 20th, the Coveside Carnival. Please mark your calendars for that special event. And also mark your calendars for Tuesday, October 22nd. We can't go because it's from 6.30 to 8.30 at the community center, the same night as our board meeting. It's the first Keene Foundation Lights on After School Expo, but parents are invited to see and understand what's going on in the after school programs. So as always, thank you, Judy Keene, and all who make this happen. And now, since we have no one else, Isaac, comments on life at the high school. Uh, good evening. These past weeks at WHS have been quite busy. As I mentioned last year, we had our school pep rally. The seniors came out victorious in almost all events. However, they were defeated by the teachers in the tug of war event. On September 30th, the senior class hosted a fundraiser at Chick-fil-A to help reduce costs for their senior activities. A new international trip has been announced, travel to Germany and Switzerland for a STEM-based educational trip. The trip is led by Ms. Shannon Bellinger. He's a math teacher at the high school. Uh, the football team, in the athletic area of the school, the football team had two games. One was against Daniel Han, where they unfortunately lost 56 to 14. But they made a return this past Friday against Farmington, 14-0. Boys soccer had four games, winning three of the four games. Girls volleyball had five games, winning three of the five games. While girls field hockey team is on a seven game winning streak, already qualifying for playoffs. <coughs> Uh, the Westfield High School Marching Band had a competition where they took first place. The school Good. is participating in Pinktober, wearing pink shirts that can be purchased, and the, that money will be donated in support of breast cancer. Uh, additionally, the school held a fall blood drive led by Miss Sue Coco. Hundreds of students came to donate and help save lives. Um, finally, in the academic area of the school, we're halfway through quarter one. <laughs> Teachers, 
teachers are setting goals that are not only in line with the school's goals, but as well as the district goals. This past week, Mr. Moore sent out a survey to parents in hopes to receive feedback for them and is hoping that parents take the time to complete it for the upcoming accreditation through the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Oh, that's Thank you. great. You Thank great you, job. Isaac. That was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions for Isaac? He's like ESPN over there. Yeah. 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 Everything does. Thank you very much. Okay, so if there's no more, any comments? Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, any objections? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming tonight and for watching. Good night from the board.